Welcome to the discussion diner. Um, I'm the Andrew Sun Founder of Openly Disruptive. Um, we're all about helping people do disruptive innovation, so how to understand how technology and cultural encounters coming together and all the changes that are going on right now might not be picked up in the future. So thanks for being with us today. Um, we've got a great crowd. Thank you for So our first speaker, down from Minneapolis, where he's an application engineer. So uh, uh, Jeff DeGrange had been our speaker, and Jeff is actually, uh, a lot of you know that Jeff has spent a lot of time in St. Louis. He's the vice president. Um, he's the vice president of Wistratus is developing new business solutions in aerospace, defense, um, vehicle industries. Um, unfortunately, the board said, hey, we want you to stick around for Tuesday for a meeting. And um, he thought, well, they'd send a check, so I probably want to do that. So he sent, um, he sent Brian, which is great because um, Brian actually is an application engineer working at the forefront of how to integrate these things into people's production systems. So he has a, a great sense of what's going on in that world. Um, he's very knowledgeable about it, so we're, we're really lucky. And, and so Brian is going to talk to us and explain to us a little bit about exactly where is this going. So we also have 3D printed stuff, and it's like kind of cool, but it's kind of, it's like it's like a happy meal toy sometimes. It feels like it's interesting, but is this really going to solve any of my problems? He's going to point to where this is poised to go in the near future and why. Following up from that, we've got two people from here in the region that are going to actually talk about business opportunities that they see for using this uh, to launch businesses that weren't previously possible. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, everybody else, their slides are going to advance on their own. Brian, um, he's going to get to advance so, uh, But it's still a, it's still a a little bit intimidating thing. You'll have time afterwards with questions. We have 10 minutes between presentations to make sure that we can have lots of discussion and talk about what this means for our own opportunities. So, ready? Well. Thank you, Dan. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. It's, as Dan said, this is going to be a huge challenge for me to. Uh, explain. I've been with Stratasys uh, for over 17 years, and to condense all this into six and a half minutes, uh, I thought was going to be pretty much impossible. So, bear with me as we go through this. Also, too, before I get into it, as Dan stated, the group that I work for, we focus now on the aerospace applications, automotive. So, some of the examples, or most of the examples, are going to have that theme to them. Um, but please think outside of the box. These, all of these applications, can be. Uh, applied to a wide variety uh, of different industries. So, all right. So first of all, just to show you a quick product overview, you see the U-print in the back here. Uh, the Fortis machines are on the bottom, which are the FDM sides. Here in the middle are the Polyjet sides with the UV polymer. What gets us into a lot of these applications are the materials. These are what are making the difference. So as you've heard today, the thermoplastics on the FDM side, true thermoplastics, ABS, polycarbonates, on the photopolymer sides, everything, everything from UV cure, clear materials to soft rubber-like materials. And the ability then to combine those materials and print soft, hard, in one part. Um, lots of different applications for those. So I know we weren't going to, we were going to talk about end use parts, but I want to touch on a couple applications that we've been focused on here in the near term, which is actually tooling substitutes. Getting away from a traditional metal tool and substituting a plastic tool. Now who would have thought, me included, that you can bend metal, sheet metal, stainless steels, aluminums over plastic. It's, it's just fantastic uh, from a durability standpoint as what you can do with this technology and the materials. So, Anybody has any questions on this operation, the technology, how this works, feel free to come up and talk to us. But again, the benefits also of this technology of being a traditional original tool here, you start off with a big block of material, typically machine 80% of what away, ending up with your end part. Where on the additive side, you only build what you need. So you optimize, you use a bit less materials, you use less build times, uh, saving costs, all that type of uh, value benefits. Here's an end use part uh, for vertical wind turbines. Now, it, it's hard to see in this uh, demonstration, but these are actually 11 to 15 feet high. And the application here is what's known as a soluble core or as a consumable core. Uh, inside here is a dense uh, matrix of plastic that is used to create the shape and the structure. 
And on a wind turbine, you have very high loads on the, the leading, what they call the leading edge. And as you can see in this picture here, the density of these matrices are then increased in these areas to give the support and the struck, uh, strength needed in these areas. Where it doesn't need it, you open it up, you lose less material. So you're optimizing your structures for these applications. I know a lot of them are busy, lots of, of uh, text on there, but just look at the pictures. <laughs> uh, another great example here too is uh, we're teaming up with a company called Optomech where they use a process called aerosol jet where they're actually printing 3D conductive inks. Now we're combining the two technologies here in an application we're doing UAVs. So unmanned air vehicles wings where they can print uh, different types of electronics on that wing. Antennas, strain gauges. So now on a wing you have a strain gauge just printed on it so you can see stresses during flight as to what is that wing experiencing in real time. Uh, printing live video, so uh, combining these technologies and giving great, great capabilities uh, with what they can do. Here's an example uh, currently being used for wind tunnel testing, but this is one of the examples where I, I ask everybody to think outside the box. Uh, plastic parts on your cars, same plastics that, that are being extruded on these machines. So think of in the future, instead of having your collision repair shop that's ordering in or warehousing or stocking all these big parts, they have a system in house that all they do is get the model of your car, print that out, schedule it out for your appointment, and you're actually getting an additive type part instead of uh, an injection molding. So warehousing, shipping, all those types of uh, different opportunities to uh, capitalize on. Another uh, application here where uh, championship motorsports or aftermarket uh, automotive parts, very, very, very popular right now with customizing your cars, doing those uh, tweaking out with the, the fancy looking type components. This is actually reversing our process. Um, we're actually using, uh, on our technologies, we have a model material and a support material. Support material just assists in overhangs or, or assists in building it's actually removed. We're flipping it on this process and actually using the soluble material as the model, wrapping it in a carbon composite here, creating very complex geometry, one-offs, two-offs, that are custom to each application. But there's no tooling. So they can do all these types of uh, processes without any tools uh, very quickly. Irby, uh, hybrid cars. So this is a, a car that is uh, quoted to be 200 miles per gallon on the highway, 100 miles per gallon in the city. It's a combination of electric and motor. But on this application, uh, the entire body is printed with additive te uh, technologies, in this case, uh, ABS material. So on one of the larger systems. Uh, the next several slides here, again, have the aerospace th theme to them. Uh, ECS ducts, ECS ducts, mouthful. And uh, environment control systems is basically what that is. Uh, avionics racks. Now these are very low volume custom applications um, where they're, they're benefiting from traditional uh, operations which would be metal. So they'd be doing well bits so you can see weight savings, fuel savings. It's amazing some of the numbers that industry has said from one pound of fuel or one pound of weight can save up to 11,000 gallons of fuel per aircraft. Just astronomical what weight savings. Uh, a few other examples of the end use parts of inside of a, a cockpit. So these aircrafts are actually in service for 20, 30, up to 40 years, much longer than what they first anticipated. But they're needing to upgrade avionics, uh, different types of uh, mods and upgrades where they're actually taking the ABS, or the Ultem material in this case, which is known as an FST material, flame, smoke, and toxicity. In other words, it sets on fire and will kill you. So a lot of the components inside of aircraft are made with this material. This actual material is extruded on uh, the Fortis line of equipment, and they're doing these end-use parts. We're customizing. Uh, one of the main <coughs> applications here is in the business jet community. You can think of your very high-priced custom airplanes where they want you know, their, their looks, their, their futuristic looks to it. Uh, with the ability, what they call hydro printing, um, it's a water process where they actually take an ink pattern, um, wood grains. Lots of uh, your cars have the wood grain uh, components within the dash system, steering, steering wheels. It's all done with the same process of hydroforming. It's not wood, as you can tell. So it's a, an ink process that the, the part is 
basically submerged into this uh, film that wraps around the part and gives you this impression of carbon fiber, wood grains, uh, camos, all those types of applications. So they can really do a lot of customizing uh, using these complex and, and hybrid type uh, approaches to the systems. Uh, UAV is a very hot uh, topic within the aerospace and defense industry naturally. You know, uh, no, no uh, sacrifice to human life with these types of applications. So developing uh, flying vehicles that are very modular uh, where they can uh, have these smaller systems like you see in the back here out in the, in the field and be printing these components depending on what that particular mission is going to be recalling, whether it's a camera, whether it's some other type of a payload. They can really modulize the files that they send to these systems to create these types of parts and components and replacement parts. If it crashes, they'll build another one, get it back up in the air. This was a, a one that I had the pleasure of doing. One of the uh, most, I was surprised to, to find out that a common problem within battlefields is the availability of sterile surgical instruments. Um, so this was a, a DARPA project with a uh, service chiefs fellowship program where they decided what can we do to print a, a surgical kit, a basic surgical kit in the field. And what we developed was, as you can see, there's a U-print here, it's very difficult to see. There's actually a 4,000 watt generator, gas power generator in the back with an extension cord running to that system. And it's a, a mock field presentation where they're actually performing a surgery utilizing tools built right off of that machine in a mock field trial with a, a soldier wearing a cut suit. But they're actually cutting it, pulling it, cutting uh, tissue samples, uh, uh, tissue forceps, all the traditional tools being built out of this because of the temperatures that we actually uh, can extrude at. It's actually sterile when it comes out of that machine. It's at 300 some degrees Celsius uh, when it's actually being extruded. So good application shows you know, the, the, the possibility of where they can take this. Uh, this was uh, one that was just shown here uh, at a, a conference out in uh, Florida, the AMUG, Additive Manufacturing User Group Conference we're utilizing the polyjet technology here um, for fashion design. This dress was made entirely out of additive te uh, technologies. So the polyjet side utilizing the soft tango skin feel uh, like and be being able to blend those, those feels of a durometer uh, that has some rigid, uh, flexible, and just some really fantastic innovating uh, type applications. I hope I'm on time here, but I'm going to wrap up with uh, what I, this one always is a, what I consider to be a, a heart or a tearjerker. So if anyone is interested in it, I highly advise going out to the Stratasys website and learning about Emma Arms. Uh, Emma was born with a uh, arthrogripopus multiplex congenita. Um, it's basically when she was born, her feet were up by her ears. Um, and what this disease does, it basically does not allow them to lift their own limbs. They don't have the strength to, to supply the, the uh, strength uh, to, to lift it. And they came out with a product that they called the Rex, which is basically a little endoskeleton that the, was allowed for her to uh, actually put it on herself. And by the use of rubber bands, it made her limbs weight neutral. And she was able to start to learn basic functions of drawing, feeding herself, where the traditional mach uh, machines was actually on a stand. They actually had a stand there where this is something that she could wear. Now they utilized all these parts on a dimension system, a similar system to the uh, machine you got in the back. And as she's growing, they're just taking those CAD files and increasing it in the sizes and places that she needed, reprinting another one, popping it into the assembly and she's right back on, a, on her feet. And uh, it's a great story out there that uh, she spoke her first complete sentence using this because they took this Rex off of her and she started crying. And she said, I want that. And the doctors looked at the mother and says, well, why is she crying? She says, because that's the first complete sentence she's ever spoke. So a great story on, on the uh, ability to use additive technologies uh, within this. So if anyone has any desire to do that, I highly advise go out to the Stratasys website to, to take a look. I'm actually out of breath for that. I mean, that's a workout. <laughs>
Brian kind of starts us down the path of seeing this, that it's hard to wrap your head around something that's out there that's, that's so transformative and what its potential is until you start seeing some examples. And some of these examples are really powerful. Um, I just put up here on, to kind of aid us in this discussion, and, and Brian, you know, I'd be curious, so we do these things called idea ecosystems, and there are four things that I think are kind of interesting about additive when it comes to solving problems that are beyond the prototype or beyond the hobby space. Um, you know, one of them is complexity is at no greater cost. So like that, that whole exoskeleton for Emma. So once you create that model, that can be, you know, oh, well, I want to add other attachment points for other rubber bands. I want to do all these other things. And that doesn't cost you anything different to print. It's only the cost of the material. There's no extra tooling cost. There's, you know, there's, it really changes the work. So you can do things that are much more complex. Then a lot is infinitely customizable. So none of those tools, so none of those things required things that were very complicated, great to set up, and a lot of, and a lot of, you know, oh, we're going to have to have this company supply this jig, supply this part, supply this intermediary part. It's all just done, and so you can do one-off, very complex things. Um, next thing is it's de-skilling machine fabric. So de-skilling sounds like a threatening thing, and um, but what it, you know, think about. The history of technology has been that de-skilling all kinds of things, you know. So, you know, the printing press de-skilled the scribe's art, you know. So, what this does is it changes it so that you could actually take and go into a rural health clinic and be able to have somebody scan and create that, and then you output it, and you would actually be able to build something like the Emma exoskeleton without all of those people that probably had to be at that research hospital the first time around. Um, you know, so that you can take those things out. And what does that mean when you get more entry level people doing things, you're switching things around, and that's interesting. And then the last thing is it's kind of a last mile solution. So if you think about to make an exoskeleton out of traditional things, well, you would have stainless steel parts, and the stainless, the ore would have been mined up here, and it would have been sent here to be refined, and then it would have been sent there to turn into machine parts, and sent over here to be compiled into the whole thing, and then that whole thing sent to a warehouse, and that whole thing eventually sent to where it was needed. And now what you're doing is you're taking the ABS, and you're, you're just sending the ABS one time. Or whatever you're making out. So it's a very different supply chain kind of solution.